In the week that Belinda Bowers' Snap becomes one of the only crime fiction novels ever to be longlisted for the Man Booker Prize, we ask, does this legitimise us crime writers? Are we now real authors? No. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Good morrow to you, Bob. Oh, excuse me, I'm just polishing my Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> um, well, it's an extraordinary piece of news, isn't it? We might as well dip straight into that. Well, yes, but why should it be such a surprise? You know, I think you know, it's just because something's popular doesn't mean that it's less good than, than, than uh, you know, uh, isn't in its own right a, a piece of literature. Oh, absolutely, And yeah. uh, I think this is sort of, hopefully, will bring that particular debate uh, to, to an end. Um, yeah, well, you, I've yeah, not read Snap, um, but you know, it's it's been nominated, and I'm, I dare say there are many other great crime novels uh, through the decades, through the ages that, that that could have been. So, I mean, it's certainly a great step in the in, in the right direction. I mean, uh, for me, it's not that it it shouldn't have been nominated because, of course, it should. But it's the, it's the fact that it doesn't normally happen. No, and the Man Booker Prize is seen as quite a kind of a, a snobby literary. I mean, you know, what is literary fiction? We could get really philosophical about this, but you know, it, it's seen as kind of excluding genre fiction. Yes, um, of, of all types, whether that be you know kind of romance or sci-fi or what have you. So yeah, that, I think that's why it's a surprise. Um, it, you know, it's probably not a sign of the way things are going. Which you know, the, the slippery slope fallacy, I'm sure, has come out below the line in the comments section of some newspapers. Um, um, but you know, it's not the first crime novel ever to be long listed. But um, it is a it is a, a nice nod, I think, to yes, and and, and long overdue, and, and hopefully long may it last. I mean, you know, it's it's one of the most popular genres in in the world, and it, and it can be so easily dismissed by many people as just just <coughs> storytelling, and um, uh, well, not exactly slight, but not up to uh, great works of, of of literature. Well, okay, for, you know, fair enough to some degree. Uh, that might be acknowledged in some some areas, but there are some great writers, some fantastic writers turning mm. uh, to the to the genre, and and why not? And uh, as far as I'm concerned, many of the the, the finest uh, writers in the in in, cr- in crime fiction uh, are are great writers are in their own in this way. Room. Yes, uh, well, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Let me just put this back on the shelf. There, yeah. I love Sweden. It's marvellous. I'll just give it another little rub. Marvellous. All right. So, recommendations of the week, if you please. I've had some time to read this week. Yes, and not only have I had some time to read, but as you can see, Bob, I am the majority of the way through this. Yes, he's holding um, up a book, book uh, yeah. where there's a sort of... What is this sticking out of it's it? It's a bookmark. It's, <laughs> a, it's an Adam Croft bookmark. <laughs> it's, it's, we won't go into that. He's yes, plugging his own books even at this point. It, 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 the reason I'm using an Adam Croft bookmark is because yeah. I've got hundreds of the bloody things. Yes, OK. Well, actually, <laughs> can give me a few, them. actually. Um, but yes, that, that is... Um, it, it's about for, 90% of the way through this book, which is a marvellous book. It's a Need to Know by Karen Cleveland. Um, not an author I was aware of beforehand. And to be honest, with you it's one that i've had for a while but i've not read because it's kind of billed as a kind of an espionage thriller and i suppose in a slight way it is but it's a domestic psychological thriller with espionage being the the backdrop i suppose um i like that i like that balance yeah well our character vivian miller um is a cia analyst but it's it's not about you know the in-depth kind of workings of the spy world. It's it's kind of a domestic thing. She um, she is uh, on her her work computer looking through these files that they've um, picked up from the Russians, and you know they've been hacking to their computers and what have you. And um, she comes across pictures of five people who are these Russian spies, and one of them is her husband. Oop oop oop. Yeah. And that's when it then kicks off big time. Yes, and well it, would. Um, it then becomes very much a kind of a, a psychological thriller, a domestic thriller. And she's trying to work out who her husband is, what the link is with the Russians. There's a little bit of espionage thrown in there. But but trust me, I'm not uh, an espionage thriller reader. Um, and I loved this book. And I, I still am loving it. And it's, it's nearly finished. And I'm just holding off that last bit because... Uh, you know, I'm I'm really enjoying it and really savouring it. So, I would, who's uh, it written by then? Uh, by Mi- Karen Cleveland. Oh, I thought um, it said Mrs. Trump. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> she she spent eight years as a CIA analyst, and um, the last six of which were uh, in counterterrorism. So she knows of what she speaks. She knows writes. her stuff. Yes, yeah. and um, yeah, highly recommend that book. It's Need to Know by Karen Cleveland. It's um, if you like espionage thrillers, if you like psychological thrillers, if you just like a damn good read. Um, that is my pick of the week. Well, I'm going to get that. Well, listen, here's uh, I've got two picks, and the first one is. Um, uh, uh, a pick I'm giving uh, uh, a pre 
uh, guest interview, uh, Pop4. Uh, Kate Rhodes is going to be a guest on uh, Partners in Crime in a few weeks' time. Um, I have just read uh, Hell Bay, uh, which is a uh, fascinating uh, brilliantly evocative uh, book uh, which stars stars her main protagonist is uh, D.I. Ben Keto um, after 10 years working for the murder squad in London a traumatic event has left D.I. Ben Keto grief stricken he's tried to resign from his job but his boss has persuaded him to take a three month uh, holiday to consider Ben plans to work in his Uncle Ray's boatyard in the tiny silly island of Briar where he was born hoping to mend his shattered nerves. His plans go awry when the body of a 16-year-old Laura Trescothic is found on the beach at Hell Bay. It's absolutely terrific. I, I have never been to the Silly Isles. I know Cornwall uh, very well. I spent well, quite a lot of the last few years down there, uh, as it happens. Um, there's, there's a sentence in that description that you have to see rather than hear. Ben plans to work in his Uncle Ray's boatyard on the tiny Silly Island. Uh, it's uh, on the tiny silly island. I, I, I thought, what, what is that? That's why I had a quick peek because you don't see how it's spelt when you're when you're oh, just of listening. Of course, so, uh, well done. Yes, of it, course. It just sounded quite. Uh, quite it's, funny. it's the silly Isles. Yes. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> well, again, for people that were around the world listening, is a, a, a beautiful mm. uh, group of uh, of isles uh, off the southwestern coast of uh, of the UK. Right in the Gulf Stream. Uh, quite tropical, actually, considering it's yes, it's not the British Isles. Yes, it's, get um, palm trees and all sorts of things down there. But it's a beautiful place, uh, uh, apparently, and you would certainly imagine so uh, by uh, Kate Rhodes' wonderful description of it. And uh, the, the Guardian says, beautifully written and expertly plotted, this is a masterclass. Uh, Rachel Abbott, absorbing and complex, Hellbay kept me guessing until the final pages. It's a terrific, uh, a terrific book by a wonderful uh, writer who we will be interviewing uh, v- very shortly. Um, but uh, in advance of that, why don't you download a copy on Kobo, have a read and uh, send us some questions. You might. Doesn't want look to very ask sunny Kate. on the cover, does it? Uh, it doesn't look well. You it's see, like it's not a storm always sunny. Brewing. The, it's not always sunny in the Silly Isles, mm. and this is a particular scene that Kate minds very, very well. It does rain uh, in 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 the Silly Isles, as it uh, most people know who've gone on holiday. It can rain in Cornwall too, mm. as beautiful as it is when the sun is out. Well, I was in Corfu <laughs> earlier this year, and it, it absolutely tipped it down one day. I've never seen rain like it. So. Yes. Oh, God, you told me about that. Nearly flooded. Yes. Well, th- this is. This is the the age of extreme weather conditions that we're all living through. For, uh, for, for well, we all know the reasons why. No way is safe. But not everyone wishes to acknowledge it. Uh, my second one. <coughs> do excuse my slight cough, by the way. I have uh, a slight cough. It's as simple as that. My second one. This is television one, a detective series. Well, it's not really because it's 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 called fake. Or Fortune. I love this programme. Well, yes, and so do I. It's on BBC uh, One. Uh, it is available on iPlayer, and hopefully it's available around the world if you get BBC. It, uh, it is a detective story. Um, uh, Fiona Bruce, uh, well-known newsreader in the UK and presenter of the Antics Roadshow, uh, joins up with Philip Mould, who's a leading uh, art expert and has his own uh, prestigious gallery in London, uh, to track down... Uh, to try and find out whether certain paintings are actually fake or not. And the first one, I think it might even be the fifth series now, uh, deals with a a painting that was bought for £165,000 and attributed to the great uh, 20th century artist William Nicholson. However, that painting had failed to convince the leading authority on Nicholson's work, Patricia Reed, who had brought out the latest catalogue Raison, uh, the official list of of, uh, Williamson's works. Now, uh, fake Take off fortune took this on for the uh, present owner of the picture and an extraordinary detective story it was too i don't want to ruin it in case well hopefully you'll catch up with it if you haven't already seen it hell of a twist though yes. like any good detective story a, a great twist so detective inspector fiona bruce and uh, <laughs> uh, detective sergeant philip mold are on the case and they go to no less a go to experts in Canada, they have it forensically analysed, they go to a, uh, a leading ha- a handwriting expert to confirm that it's William Nicholson's... The level of detail, though, in the investigation is like a murder investigation. I was watching it with my wife the other night, and um, I-, I said, you know, I really like this programme, and, and you know, she sort of read the, the blurb, if you like, on, on, on the... Um TV planner. I said, oh, I don't think that's my thing. I'm not really into art. And I said, well, neither am I. But it's 
it is like a murder investigation. It, there are forensics yeah. there. They're trying to, you know, work back in time and work out, you know, who this painting's been owned by. They're looking at, like I said, the handwriting. They're doing um, x-rays on it to see what other paintings might be underneath the same canvas has been used on. It's, it, it is an extraordinary piece of work. And, you know, these these paintings are you know, potentially worth millions of pounds. So and of course, putting that work in is... is they're investigating a possible crime, which is why yeah. we're talking about it, about, yeah. about it now. But if you do watch, it's got some unusual twists and one of them and I don't think I'm giving much away is that Nicholson uh, would pass on his his genius uh, to certain uh, students uh, uh, known as the Sunday painters um, and one of them who may even be suspected of having painted the picture himself was none other than Winston Churchill never heard of him never never yeah, <laughs> so there we are. It's a fascinating if you can get it. Fake or fortune? Uh, BBC One. It's on the iPlayer, and hopefully it will be being I'm shown all around the world. Pretty sure that is worldwide. I read something about it the other day that it's one of the the BBC's kind of big um, overseas successes, yeah. and it's watched by millions of people. So no dead bodies. No dead bodies. No, no well, murders. Ho- hopefully not. No. Just unless the Fiona Bruce of crime. flips and. Uh, and goes off on one completely and she ends up slaughtering people. Yes. That would be a nice twist, wouldn't it? Yes. Anyway, on to today's guest. Um, I'm very ah, excited about this one. It's, so am I. Um, this, for me, is, is where it all began. I was, I was reading one of this uh, gentleman's books um, when I first decided that I wanted to be a crime writer. So, um, blame him. <laughs> Stephen Booth is the author of the Cooper and Fry crime series set in the heart of the beautiful Peak District. He previously worked as a journalist and sub-editor for the Daily Express and The Guardian. His 18th Cooper and Fry novel, Fall Down Dead, was released in the UK yesterday. Uh, Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you. Um, now you, you very kindly sent me a, a copy of Fall Down Dead, which I've been reading for the last couple of weeks, and it is absolutely fantastic. Um, let's cut straight to it. Tell us about the new book. The new one, Fall Down Dead. Well, I like to reflect what's happening in the world around me, and um, the Peak District is a beautiful place, but can be quite dangerous. Um, there are lots of incidents of people going up walking on the hills without being properly prepared or equipped. Um, they get into trouble and they have to be rescued. It just happens all the time. So I imagined a group of people who've gone up onto the hills unprepared and get lost in the fog, and one of the group doesn't come back down alive. So it's kind of a... It's almost a take on the old country house mystery, but set on on the moors, a limited group of suspects who might have committed this murder in the fog. Oh, that's very good. In, in, we'll, we'll meet you in the library with your rucksacks. <laughs> <Rare Christy. laughs> oh, it sounds absolutely terrific. I've got to catch up on these because I've read the, your first three and, of course, starting with Black Dog, and I noticed, uh, looking at the uh, the blurb of Fall Down Dead, uh, that since I uh, last visited Cooper and Fry, uh, they've been promoted quite dramatically through the ranks. <laughs> yes, well... <laughs> <laughs> of course, after... So this is the 18th um, uh, investigation with them, so... Uh, uh, I need to go back, I think, and, uh, and, and, and go through the whole uh, series, which is wonderful. It's a great series. I mean, hugely, hugely popular. Um, and I, I have loved uh, the books that I've read, and uh, many of my friends are, are big fans of yours, and including the one sitting next to me at the mm. moment, actually. Well, it's, uh, I, mean, I hate to, um, to put you on the spot, Stephen, but it's actually one of your books that inspired me to write my first one. Oh, well, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I've actually <laughs> told you that or not before, but uh, it's why I'm so keen to have you on the show it was, uh, it was Dying to Sin I was reading um, when I was on holiday oh, yeah. about 10 years ago so you've got a lot and, to uh, answer for Stephen yes it's all your fault I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> you're the man who started oh, it quite all prou- I'm quite proud of that because yeah. you've done brilliantly oh thank you very much you, you've not done too badly yourself 18 <laughs> books into the series is is extraordinary yeah. and I mean I mean, Cooper and Fry have been on some some adventures to say the least but, um, for those who don't know the series um, I mean there were they were having plenty of adventures before the series even started, and Diane, in particular, has got um, got a bit of a past to her. She has, and I, I, I find her very interesting to write about. You know, I write from the points of view of both those characters, and I find her the more the more interesting of the two. She's a more complex character. She's quite um, she's got this very brittle facade, 
and she doesn't treat people very well, including Ben Cooper. <laughs> but underneath that facade, she's a very damaged person because of what's happened to her in the past. And I find, I find that very interesting to try and explore those two sides of her and encourage readers to see that, that other side of the character. Mm. I mean, the books are, like we've spoken about this before, but your books are so character driven as well. That's, that, and that, that shines through really in, in the tales that you tell there. I mean, the, you know, the plots are fantastic and they're intricate and the, you know, the murders and the investigations are superb, but they're, they're always such strong characters. It's funny, you know, Adam. When I when I started writing these books right at the beginning, I, you know, I thought of myself as writing murder mysteries, mm. and that the plot was the most important thing. But I very quickly realised from the response I got from readers that they were relating mostly to the characters. It's it's Ben Cooper and Diane Fry who keep readers coming back to read the next book in the series. They want to know what happens next to Ben Cooper, you know, and. And the other factor which which readers write to me about all the time is the is the Peak District setting. You know, the locations have become so important for readers over the course of a series. And and of course, you mostly use real locations. I mean, the, the town of uh, Edendale, I, I believe, is um, a, a mashup of a, of a couple of real places. But um, I, I, I use real places whenever I can. But. Yeah. Given the nature of the books I'm writing, I try and avoid getting sued. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, nobody wants many but... murders in their pubs, do they? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do have to fictionalise the places sometimes, just yeah. change the details a bit. But people still recognise the locations, and they will go out and try and find them all, you know. It, it's, it, it comes down to the smallest detail sometimes. I've got one book which opens with... Um, a threatening phone call made to the police, which turns out to have been made from a, a particular public phone box in a village called Wardlow. And lots of readers have told me that they've travelled out to Wardlow to look at the phone box. You know, and <laughs> it's a nice red one, but it's just <laughs> a phone box. <laughs> and I think that's important to readers because it's a physical connection between the real world and the fictional world that they're reading about you know they they want so much to be part of this world that ben cooper and diane fry live in that they've got to try and find all the locations i think it's just just magical it is uh, and, and the books are just so vivid as well and and descriptive i mean only and, until i read the books i had never visited the peak district it wasn't oh, wasn't, wasn't somewhere I, I even thought about to be honest but um <laughs> as a result of reading the books i did go on holidays to the peak district um and uh, stayed in castleton for a week and went walking oh, yeah. around and and absolutely loved it and Having been there, the books are brought to life even more now. It's I mean we've spoken many times in this podcast about books tied into locations. I think this is one of those series that you know even if you don't know the Peak District, you really feel like you're there. Mm. Well, that that's what I I try to do because I'm I'm very conscious because the books are sold all over the world. You know, most of my readers have actually never heard of the Peak District. You know, in the USA or or Russia or Japan. You know, they don't know it. So I'm I'm trying to paint a picture of it for those readers and try and put them right there in the location. Mm. Well, it definitely works, I suppose. It must be, um, we think of the Peak District being kind of, you know, something that's here and is ours, but I suppose to, to an Italian reader reading Stephen Booth, it must be like us reading uh, Andrea Calieri or something. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Apennines or yeah. Sicily or somewhere like Very that. Exotic. You know. I yeah. sometimes think, you know, my Japanese readers, for example, probably think I invented the Peak District, you know, mm. it must seem so strange. <laughs> well, it is, and it's, it's kind of mythical, and, I, and that's something which mm. kind of comes into the book sometimes, isn't it? There's this, um, I mean, you, you know, you don't go down the route of making them paranormal books, but there's always that, almost a slight undercurrent that there is something in the landscape that is kind of intrinsically... Um, Menacing yes, and menacing. extraordinary and yeah. mysterious, I suppose, really. Yeah, I and mean, the landscape is a character. Mm. That is the way I feel about it, I, I think. There's so much folklore and mythology and myth and legend in the Peak District, a lot of um, superstitions. And sometimes I like looking at maps and sometimes just the names of the places. You can see what sort of imaginations people had in the past when they were living out there in the middle of nowhere with no lighting, of course, 
in pitch darkness, they peopled the landscape with all kinds of ghosts and demons and devils and, you know, it was all there. And in, in my imagination, it is kind of still there, just underneath the surface, I think. Well, you're right about the names, of course. And in fact, the mountain that you um, uh, set uh, your uh, murder on is uh, Kinder Scout. Yes. Um, that's an unusual name. Um, it's, it, this is one of the most iconic locations in the Peak District. It's the highest mountain there. But also, and this comes into the book, it was the scene of the a famous mass trespass back in the 1930s which was the start of the whole movement that created national parks because people wanted access to the moors and at that time they were they weren't allowed to because they was of the grouse shooting and there was a big um a big deliberate trespass onto the moors and clashes with gamekeepers and people were taken to court and it was a big thing in the 1930s and that that led directly to the creation of the first national park, which was, of course, the Peak District. Good, and you say, I didn't know that. So I history was made on Kinder Scout. Well, you, you're making me want to get in the car it. and get up there straight away. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I haven't been there for a couple of years. I, I had the, the, the great good fortune to play uh, Buxton Opera House for oh, a week. Oh, yes. Oh, wonderful uh, Opera House. Uh, oh, God, it's a wonderful theatre, isn't it? A, a Frank Matcham uh, theatre. It's absolutely beautiful and, and, and a great time. But, but while I was there for the week, it was fairly exhausting. So I didn't get out to the countryside as nearly as much uh, as I would have loved to. But my, my brother and sister in law have just moved to Bollington um, further north and uh, they Cheshire, can, yeah. yeah and they can literally sort of walk out of their front door and start walking you know upwards of course <laughs> uh and uh, <laughs> uh and so the peaks are on our doorstep so i'm looking forward to visiting them too but um so i mean you've got i mean fall down dead a great title um uh I, I, there's another. There's another author that uses dead occasionally. I sort of <laughs> P, Peter James must be Who? Peter. J <laughs> yes, exactly. He'll, he'll be he'll be so miffed that he's you found a title with dead in the in, in, in the in it that he hasn't used himself. So yeah. um, but... congratulations with <laughs> <to> that. <laughs> now here's a question that we ask lots of um, uh, uh, writers, but I, I particularly wanted to ask you, Stephen. Um, it's certainly not the be all and end all. I mean, uh, books are are are, are uh, what you write, and stories are, are what you tell. Uh, but I've always thought, with your books in particular, that they would adapt to another medium, that of television, with the greatest possible of ease. Um, they seem naturally uh, um, set up uh, to do that, and certainly with the uh, location as we've just been talking about, and the, the backdrop of the, the Peak District would be very good on the eye. I mean, has there been any uh, talk of uh, of that? Uh, oh, gosh. Um, Cooper and Fry have spent most of the past 18 years in development. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. <laughs> we had, we had David Mark it. talking about that. Yeah, yes. It better lots be good of, then. <laughs> lots of luncheons and smoke being blown I'm, up. So. I'm sure you know, Bob, that uh, a lot of books get optioned and, you know, never actually get anywhere near the screen. We've we've spent so many years doing this. We've um, we've had two finished scripts, two different scripts for the first episode, all ready to go. We've had producers and scriptwriters have been up to the Peak District and have taken them around all the locations. And oh, we've just been through it, you know, time after time, and we still haven't got anywhere any nearer to being on the screen. Well, very I frustrating television. Yes. Well, it is really because uh, it's so much of it's out of your control. Oh, you... totally. I mean, all, all I do is I sign a contract and I've given away any control over what happens. And all I do is I go to, for a meeting with the producers once a year, and and they say, well, you know, we really want to do it, but it's not just not quite the right time, uh, or you know, all that kind of thing. Or, or they're looking for something different, you know. They they they, they option it when they think um, oh, pineapples are in fashion, and as soon as the script's done, pineapples are, it's bananas that everyone. Wants. I mean, you just can't keep up with it. I know that my book's been optioned twice and uh, over over periods, and all I know about it is, I mean, it's very jolly, and it's very nice. I tend to put on quite a bit of weight through lunches because there's always <laughs> there's always a lunch to be had, um, uh, um, several lunches to to talk over the finer details and to, and to keep you on board. 
but it is a, it, so many writers talk about the frustrations of it and I, I understand it but that doesn't take away from the fact that I think uh, Cooper and Fry should come to the screams and mm. I think they would be incredibly incredibly popular but I really personally I, I feel a little bit ambivalent about it because I, I know they would be popular but from from my point of view I uh, you know, I'm the I write the novels, and I've become very conscious of having conversations with producers and scriptwriters of um, how many changes would happen to the characters and the stories if it ever did get onto the screen. All those compromises, you know, that happen in TV, and I, I've always felt doubtful about whether I would want to watch it myself on the screen because I know it wouldn't be my Ben Cooper and Diane Fry anymore. No, this you know is, what I mean? Yeah, I do. It's a cry that I've uh, I've heard go up from from many authors, and and certainly not for me. I'll take the money and run. <laughs> 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 well, we've just had the ice cream van outside the yes, studio. Yes, if anyone's here, wondering so what that noise was. If you're was. thinking of running with money, go and get me a, a, a call it. Um, uh, well, that's interesting because obviously you you know the classic stories with uh, writers being unhappy with uh, actors that have been cast. I mean, it was a classic one yeah. with Frost, for instance, and mm. uh, and uh, even and Morse and Morse. Mm. Uh, 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 what have you? So I, I can understand that. And that, that must apply to readers as, as well, because readers have a very strong image of of who their Cooper and who their Fry are and what they look like from your descriptions or whatever. But that's a very strong mental image. And when you're suddenly presented with a completely different face, um, uh, and you're not probably going to bond with it particularly well. So this this is something that comes up a lot when I'm talking to readers, because actually in the book, so although I know in my own mind what Ben Cooper and Diane Fry look like. I've written 18 books about them. I'm quite clear. I don't describe them in any great physical detail in the books because I want readers to create their own pictures in their imaginations. I think that works a lot better. But that does mean that each reader has a different picture of Ben Cooper in their head when they're reading the books. Um, so if it ever did come to the TV screen, it would be somebody else's interpretation of the character well that, that can happen like. anyway i mean look at um you know uh, lee childs jack reacher he's oh. very carefully <laughs> described very obviously described you could have uh, everyone could draw the same picture of him yeah. yet they went and cast tom cruise <laughs> you know you're, you're never safe <laughs> lee took a lot of stick from his readers about that casting mm. but but he said and i think this is very interesting he said if the actor's good enough mm they can capture the essence of the character without necessarily looking exactly like them. Yeah, yeah. And I think I could see what he meant, although Tom Cruise was a bit of a stretch from Jack Reacher, wasn't Quite he? Quite literally. Well, he probably needs a bit of a stretch <laughs> to actually get to the height of the actual uh, Jack Reacher. Uh, but now, here's a, here's a question, Stephen. It, you know, obviously, you're a you know, massive, successful, best-selling author uh, with, uh, with with your books. And won every, there's a list of awards here, and I won't go through them because you've won virtually everything that you possibly can, <laughs> it seems uh, to me. But before um, becoming a full-time uh, writer, you were a journalist as a uh, Adam pointed out in the, the introduction there. How much of uh, your journalistic life and uh, your work in that profession influenced you, uh, has influenced you in your writing as a, as a novelist? I, I think being a journalist was a tremendous help. I, I actually worked on local newspapers most of my career, and I, I, that was very useful because you learn a lot of practical things like um, working to deadlines and about being edited uh, I've always felt very relaxed about, you know, somebody else editing my work. And I I learned so many, I had so many experiences meeting all kinds of different people who I wouldn't perhaps otherwise have met in any other walk of life. And it's all grist to the mill for a writer, you know, it all goes in and then comes out in. And of course, I met a lot of police officers <laughs> during my journalism career in all kinds of circumstances. And I'm writing about the police now, a real police force, Derbyshire Constabulary. And that was a tremendous help to me because I thought I knew who the characters were when I started to write about them. Yes. And do, do you have links with the police now? I mean, do you try to keep the books as procedurally accurate as possible, or is it a case of kind of a story winning for you? Or uh, story first, definitely. Um, I, I do 
try to use some procedural detail, but I, I wouldn't claim to be writing authentic police procedurals. I, I don't think anyone would want to, uh, because it, it would be very boring. <laughs> yeah, they, well, they'd, be, well, they'd both be sitting there in an office and taking phone calls from Making officers who have been out doing the work. Yeah. Well, police officers are the first be to it say that. Chapters, wouldn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> nobody would want to read it. So what I aim for is what I, what I call um, believability rather than authenticity. Uh, you know, if you can make your reader believe that this is all this all sounds right. And you only need to use a few details to, to sort of give that Im- impression. And it can be quite convincing. Even police officers who read my books will say, oh, you've got really great in- inside information just because I've used one detail that they recognise. That's that works much better, I think. Yes, write your knowledge lightly. Mm. Yes, I mean that's I mean that's interesting. I, we had Graham Bartlett, lovely Graham Bartlett on. Uh, oh yes, on, on, a on police sh- officer. Yeah, and he was just saying, you know, uh, writing a, a a crime novel. If you actually went into absolute detail and everything, you'd have a book that was sort of about five thousand pages long. Yeah, <laughs> more, more like a, 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 the results of an inquiry rather than anything else. Mm. But obviously, now this is your eighteenth book, uh, Fall Down Dead, and uh, there's no sign of Cooper and Fry fading. Certainly not in uh, in the in the public's fondness for uh, uh, the series. Um, do you see yourself continuing with Cooper and Fry, or are you tempted to uh, move into some standalones or uh, 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 other works, or are you, is it Cooper and Fry all the way for you? The, well, the one frustration of what I've been doing for the past eighteen years uh, as a writer, I've got so many other ideas for things that I'd like to to write, and I just haven't had time to work on them because. Cooper and Fry have been my my living for 18 years, which is great. But there are lots of other things I'd like to do. And I have a feeling at the moment that the next book won't be a Cooper and Fry because there's one that's burning to get out there. Um, I'm sure you understand as a writer, you know, if you've got some, you've got something that you really want to, to do. But that does that doesn't mean it will be the end of the series. Good, um, <laughs> because I'm I'm fairly conscious that even if I stop writing about Cooper and Fry, they're still out there doing their job, going about the Peak District and and you know detecting crimes, and I can come back to them any time I want to. Yes, that's, that's well. You've, that the new book sounds uh, sounds very intriguing. I always love it when a writer says, "You know, I had to write this book. I felt it felt it burning inside me." You know, it's going to yeah. be a good one then when it's come from that place. You're, you're going to have to come back and uh, tell us all about <laughs> that when that's out, Stephen. It's um, certainly. But, uh, it was just one other question I wanted to ask you. Nothing to do with books. I'm going to mention one word: goats. I thought that would be the word. Yes, I bet. That, <laughs> I, I, how could it not be? Um, maybe you could enlighten our. Um, uh, you obviously have a fondness. No, I can't. I can't say that. Can I? Um, you have. A, <laughs> what is your connection <laughs> with, with goats? When I was um, when I was working as a newspaper journalist, I, we we bred dairy goats. That was our our hobby, and we did went to shows at the weekend, agricultural shows. And I I was a judge. I used to travel all over the country. Judging at agricultural shows, it became a bit of an obsession with us. And they are very interesting animals. I mean, they're not like sheep. They have a personalities and a sense of humour, you know, and they like people. Um, but also very productive animals. I thought I thought they were fascinating. Uh, and that's what. And you know, when you, if you're working in a very sort of busy, stressful job, I, there's nothing better than to come home. And go outside and milk the goats, because it. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to isolate just... that bit and use it in the trailer, Stephen. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> because you relax completely and you forget all the stresses of the day. I think I think everybody needs something like that. That's completely different from the the day job. Yes, just to just to relax, and of course, I mean, you know, you're talking about my favourite cheese, goat's milk cheese, or whatever. Do you actually make that as well? Do you actually, uh, or do you sell your milk on, or just give it away? We, or, I, we, I should say, we don't have goats anymore. Oh, um, right. Unfortunately, when the when the books really took off, and I was travelling all over the place, and I was in America, a lot, you know. Um, I couldn't leave my wife with all the the work to do with the goats, so we did cut back on them. 
we kept a couple of old ladies who gradually died off and we lost our last goat about uh, three years ago, I think it would be now. So we are actually goatless now. <laughs> but I have to say, I do miss them. Yes. Well, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling rather sad now. I mean, I think it's a, lo- it's a, lo- it's a, lovely, it's a lovely story. I mean, I, 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 can you see yourself getting another goat? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you've made it very clear it's not compatible with an international jet-setting uh, literary <laughs> career. But it's, it's, uh, it's something we ask all our guests, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> My wife Leslie started saying uh, the other day. She started talking wistfully about goats again, she, and she said, um, "Perhaps we could get a couple of uh, pygmy goats." I don't know if you've ever seen the pygmy goats; they're very small, no. and they don't need milking. They're not as much work she said but i wonder if we've got room for a couple of pygmy goats <laughs> that's where it all begins that's where it starts <laughs> before you know it, a year down the line you'll have a farm and that's exactly right i'm gonna mention pygmy goats to my daughters they'll go absolutely nuts then i I, I wouldn't if i were you no you're probably <laughs> you know right what's gonna you're probably right <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. It's yes, been an, an absolute pleasure. pleasure to speak to you. And um, we will send everybody out to uh, to buy your new book, a wonderful book, Fall Down Dead. Well, I've I've had my little fangirl moment. Bob. Yes, oh. well, I, I'm I'm certainly not very far behind, but uh, I'm a fanboy moment, I, <laughs> I think, with a slightly deeper voice. But uh, it, 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 we talk about setting so much in this podcast, and I'm sure that listeners now are going, oh, God, not again. But these books are just so evocative of the Peak District, and the Peak District itself is a very evocative place. It's If you've not been, you can't really... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be one of these horrible people who says, well, if you've not been, you can't understand it. But if you've not been, you can't understand it. But a writer really helps you to do that. I mean, it's what I mentioned with Kate uh, Rhodes uh, earlier. She does it with the Ciliars, and Stephen has done it with the Peak District again and again and again. Uh, you know, the environment, the location is, is so important. You know, you want to be there. And you quickly know as a reader, if a person has done the research, you know, you need things described, you need to feel excited, you need to... You, uh, you need a vivid evocation of uh, of of the setting for these crimes and the investigation, if that's the nature of the particular uh, crime story. And no one does it better uh, than Stephen Booth, and consistently so over the years, as as we mentioned in the in, in the interview with him. And he's and such a nice man as well. He's he's as, he's as nice as they come. Sincerely, he is. Well, I, I had a book launch at a local pub. Um, God, how far back was this? Six years ago. The Albion. Uh, yeah, and and you know it was you know it was fairly well attended and they're mainly by local people um, and Stephen drove all the way down from the Peak District yeah. um, which has probably got to be what two hours each way just to come and see me at this book launch and um, and, and wish me success with it um, and, and then went back and it was just I thought that was just a marvellous gesture and he's, um, he's he's always doing things like that he's a really really top chap and uh, a, a lovely person to interview. So mm. thank you very much, Stephen. It, we had great fun talking to you. Yeah, and we're now um, nearly 30 episodes in. Oh, my God. That's, um, that's, that's a landmark, but I suppose we have to wait for the full year before we get all moist-eyed about it. Moist-eyed? <laughs> I wonder what you're going to say. I'm not, I'm not getting moist about the thoughts of this podcast. Well, wait till you get to the 60th. <laughs> <laughs> what, 60th birthday? Is that yes. when, uh, that's when things start getting moist. <laughs> Um, yes, but, well, we're. Um, I think I think we'll leave it at that. Shall we? Well, I think you ought to do a little bit of uh, of uh, uh, your uh, usual um, promo because our well, listeners oh, will well, be wondering yes. where to get uh, Stephen's books necessarily or where best to download them. I didn't do the promo at the start of the show. Can you think of anyone that downloads his books that, that, that people might want to sort of download? Well, I'm going to have to do a proper promo because I didn't do one at the top of the show and I'm only doing the one at the end of the show, so I've got to do it properly now, haven't I? Oh, because, my um, God, we'll lose our sponsorship. Uh, amateurs, amateurs. Um, yes, I think you should go and buy all of the books that we've mentioned, in fact. Um, Kate Rose's Hell Bay, um, Karen Cleveland's Need to Know, and, of course, um, Stephen booth um I'm actually going go and buy all of his books they're all fantastic yes by the latest one by the lot um if you have not bought a book from kobo before all of these books and more millions and millions of them are available um through the kobo's online store if you've not bought one before the lovely folk at kobo are going to give you 90 percent off of your first purchase so it's uh, virtually free it will cost you pennies for your first book um, if, if you enter the pro there if you enter 
the promo code CRIME at the checkout. That would be a better way of doing it. Um, yes, 90% off. Can't beat that, can you? No, you can't. Marvellous. May I just say what a marvellous presentation that was. Special super, mate. Well, that, that is exclusive to Partners in Crime listeners as well. I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> that's, that's an exclusive deal for Partners in Crime listeners. So head over to Kobo.com. Choose your book. Enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout. I think I've said it three or four times there now. I think I've made up for it. I don't, yes, th- I don't you... think they're going to pull us off the air, are they? Uh, well, th- well, no, I think we, we, we may have to be self pulled now, next week, <laughs> um, Stuart McBride will be our guest uh, from Aberdeen. Now, so we're talking of self belief <laughs> Yes, uh, who's a, a, a wonderful uh, Scottish crime writer, m- m- most of you will probably know, uh, and uh, another very entertaining uh, interviewer, uh, no doubt. Uh, his, uh, his books are uh, sort of, well, international bestsellers and uh, a great crime writer, and one of many great crime writers to come from Scotland um, uh, which is a question we must ask actually yeah and we've got some cracking interviews coming up in the next few weeks we've actually got ourselves organised and we know who our guests are for, for about the next month now which da, da, we really da, do da, 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 um, so if I said da, yes da, Stuart da, da, McBride da, da, at number three <laughs> if I mentioned that Stuart McBride is coming up yeah. and if I mention some names such as you know maybe McDermid maybe if I threw that one out there perhaps um, throw a Gerritsen in for good measure <laughs> Right, then, um, yeah, you might start to see where we're going in the next few weeks. Yes, well, where are we going now? I'm going to go and get a coffee. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Perfected.